Welcome to Future Customer Value, where global thought leaders share their career-defining moments. Welcome to our newest episode of Future Customer Value. I'm really excited to introduce Mahesh Motaramani today on the show. Mahesh, thanks for joining us. Hey, pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Sagar. Awesome. Well, I'm really pumped to speak to you as I've got to connect with many of my guests through the CS Angel community. And Mahesh has been so gracious to spend some time and uh, build a relationship through that network. So great. So to kick things off, I'm going to give you an introduction to Mahesh and his illustrious career through customer success and the enterprise software world. There's been a lot of awesome experiences that we'll dive into during the show today. So Mahesh has built and scaled and led professional services, customer success, and operations teams at numerous leading software companies throughout his career. Uh, he started off at Converse, spending numerous years running operations and customer-facing teams before moving to Tech Mahindra and eventually to MuleSoft, which was a very formative experience, and we'll be diving into that during the show. MuleSoft, as we know, was acquired by Salesforce after a successful IPO. Following that, uh, Mahesh moved to Data IQ and is currently at Workato, where he is running the enterprise customer success organization at Workato and has built out a numerous uh, large programs to, to help engage these customers. Beyond being a successful operator, Mahesh is also an award-winning CS strategist. In 2023, he was selected as one of the top 100 CS strategists, and he's often involved in many Slack communities, providing thought leadership and guidance to new CS leaders and CSM. So Mahesh, thank you so much for being on the show. Anything you want to add? to your, to your uh, intro here before we kick off. No, thank you for the generous intro. I think uh, I'm, you know, really glad to be on this podcast. I've heard some, you know, great insights from amazing guests, and I just hope to be, make this uh, podcast really useful one for your listeners. Awesome. This podcast is brought to you by Foresight, a full service value realization platform designed to help you unlock growth in every single account. For more information on Foresight, please email them at info at gainforesight.co. That is info at G-A-I-N-F-O-R-E-S-I-G-H-T dot C-O. And they'll be in touch. Well, we're really excited to get started here. And the first story that I want to dive into is your current state. So talk to us about Workato, your current role. And you're focusing on enterprise customers, right? That's totally different motion, different selling motion, engagement motion to engage these customers than other segments. So paint the pictures for us here, Mahesh, on what is the world that you operate in and what's what are the types of customers that you're engaging with? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so so to, to begin with, yeah, I lead uh, enterprise customer success uh, at Workado. What is an enterprise? It's a customer segment. Uh, where a customer has over a billion dollars in revenue or more than 2,500 people. So they're really looking at, uh, you know, Fortune 500 type of companies. And, uh, you know, there's some key characteristics there. One is that, you know, these customers are typically not buying uh, technology for one specific use case. They are buying something uh, for a really long-term, uh, you know, use uh, as a part of their technology stack. So there is that, uh, you know, uh, time arc that that you got to uh, keep in mind. Second, the way these customers um, want to engage with you across all phases of, uh, you know, the life cycle, if I may, uh, right from, you know, how they discover the, you know, a product. They typically wouldn't, you know, click a link to, you know, try out, right? It's hard to land a technology in an enterprise. Uh, you know, you call that shadow IT if they swipe a credit card and get get a technology like that. Um, you know, how, so how do you market to them? How do you sell to them? How do you create that, you know, sense of assurance of a very long, mutually valuable partnership uh, that allows you to land a deal, um, which is not focused just on one team, one use case, even though you start with that one use case, right? You, you want to start with what is going to give them immediate value and that, you know, uh, proof of them having made good decision, right? But the yeah. real magic lies in painting that, you know, picture of broad adoption across a similar family of use cases, right? No technology can do everything, but you want to be able to position yourself for doing 
similar category of use cases you know, across that organization. So Workado is one such platform. It's an enterprise automation, enterprise orchestration platform that is fit for use across several functions, be it HR, marketing, finance, wherever you got processes, wherever you got these, you know, uh, hundreds of applications in in modern enterprise today you got to connect them you got to you know get those systems talking in order to deliver a process to a customer to an employee to a partner right um and, and these processes these departments exist in all sorts of industries so really talking about a horizontal platform and one's got to have a different vision both on buyer side so how you educate the buyer how you educate the users uh, is completely different from some of other, uh, you know, technology companies. Um, and, and so in, in that vein, the post sales, which is where customer success comes in, is, you know, I, I want to say entirely different. Uh, what you start, uh, where you start off initially as one point of contact, one team using quickly, uh, hopefully, blows up into multiple relationships. You are multi-threaded, you're working with multiple teams. A, you know, in a, let's say a large bank, like a Bank of America could be 30 different accounts in one account. Right. You don't have one joint success plan. You're not having one QBR. You're not having one value assessment, right? You are having a lot of these engagements, a lot of balls in the air. For sure. Uh, the CSM there, uh, you know, has to have that capability of, you know, managing all those threads within a single account and sometimes we have to be in that role where we are the chief dot connector for that customer, their right. various teams. We create a community inside that company. So th those are several aspects in which enterprise is like completely uh, different ball game uh, compared to some technology products which solve you know unique problems in verticals or in sure. certain functions and capacities. I think what you said that is so relatable to a lot of other CS leaders and enterprises for horizontal solutions, you have to understand the driving business need for your product because for Workado automations platform, there's a billion things you could be doing for an organization yeah. that's a billion dollars in revenue. There's so many processes to automate. And so isolating that family or that lineage of use cases where you can start to add outsized value for your customer and then expand from there. So talk to us about how does your team and how do you as a practitioner identify that biggest, most important business need for your customers? Because there's so many places you could start, right? I'm curious how you isolate that. Yeah. So first of all, you know, we we have a fantastic, you know, uh, Workado selling system. It's a very good structured and, and tested, tried successful framework of actually sussing out those use cases where Workado can make a difference, right? So we we start very early. Uh, CSMs would typically get engaged, you know, towards the end of that validation phase uh, to start educating the customer on how to do these kinds of things, right? So even you know associating value with the use case, you know, you cannot uh, track down every possible use case, as you said, right? So we have to educate the customer and build that muscle of building a demand book of use cases. We have to educate them on how to prioritize, how to uh, you know figure out how much value each case you know each use case can possess. And so we we have a fantastic uh, you know um, automation strategy and value team which has produced you know some, assets and some bots through which customer can actually figure out uh, from this plethora of use cases. And we have, a, we have a big framework, a catalog or dictionary of use cases. You can figure out what are the most valuable use cases. And in terms of impact to an organization, um, you know, what should be prioritized? So we are actually teaching customers certain strategies already, you know, before we, you know, sign off on a deal. And they see that um, and, and want to adopt this in the, in the post sales world. So really, what what we are looking at, we are we are going by by a department and saying in this department in this domain there are certain automation you know uh, use case families. Within that, let's figure out what are your uh, pain areas, where do you have biggest gain to be made, and what value comes out. Sometimes you know you may have some pain. Um, it's huge. 
but fixing it isn't going to move a, a you know needle by a huge amount so sure. we we have to assign so just you know getting the customer to prioritize getting the customer to properly surface and categorize these use cases and then assessing their ability uh, to schedule resources to build on that that's a huge part of you know our change management posture from customer success, right? And then we bake all of that into some sort of a roadmap because there's multiple use cases across teams sure, sure, that sure. goes into that joint success plan that then my team partners with the champion or, or the economic buyer and tracks those to success. And then on the other side of that is really uh, in these, um, you know, uh, we have engagement governance, right? All these monthly strategy calls or, or QBRs or EBRs, we actually get the, economy buyer to commit to meeting us on a quarterly or a you know uh, biannually basis where we actually review the progress against wow. this roadmap and the value that they're getting out of the solution that that is incredible i i think you're probably one of the most advanced practitioners of this value realization journey from guests that i've spoken to so it's very fascinating to hear you talk about this and it makes total sense you have to start this in the sales cycle it has to be change management focused you have to keep connectivity to the economic buyer throughout the journey and make sure that you partner with them in the post-sale side. Another piece I really like what you said is change management. I think it's so easy to conflate onboarding and CS with checklists. I got to do these four things and check the box, make sure the customer's gone. Well, for the enterprise, it's not that. It's change management. Mm -hmm. You have to change the processes, the way that the, the perspective, the philosophy internally. And that's really what success is about, right? Getting the organization to adopt a new way of thinking that is facilitated by our platform to make that new way of thinking easier and more productized. So I, I love that you said that. I wanted to call that out for a second. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, um, technology doesn't change anything, right? It's important, right? But it's not sufficient. And it's people who change things. And it's the uh, you know, when people infuse the technology to change the process, change the trajectory of what they're doing, that's that's when, you know, they get the value and we as technology providers become sticky. Otherwise, it's very easy to, you know, peel off that, you know, fancy new sticker that you just put on on your stack. Yes, <laughs> so true. Uh, and that's fantastic. Yeah, technology is, it is, it, it has to be contextualized. And I think that's what, I've been learning through this journey, my past life working with enterprises as well. You, you have to put it in, in a why statement. Why is this going to matter to your organization? And if you're not doing that work of discovery and understanding the dictionary, what couple pages matter most to your customer, you lose the context. And then it's another technology platform in a sea of technologies and it goes away. So I, I think that's, that's so powerful. I want to dive in a, a bit deeper to one of the things you said, which is around the uh, actual process of the success plan, right? Where did that come from? Is this a, a top-down mandate that your CEO is saying, we need to have this realization, connectivity, this journey, or is that something you're leading? Is that bottoms up? Because I think a lot of leaders want to do this sort of motion, but they're finding roadblocks. It's it's hard to action it for numerous reasons. So I'm curious, it's amazing that this is happening. Where did that come from? Yeah, I, I think that's that's been the business strategy, right? And And primarily to help customers focus, right? You you give someone an automation tool. It's like, uh, you know, uh, you're looking at, you know, kid in a candy store, right? People want to do all sorts of things. And you could end up doing things that are, you know, candidates for automation, but really poor processes getting automated. So how do you sort through all of that and figure out where does most value come from? And so that whole value motion uh, you know, gets gets triggered. Uh, for us, it's it's well formalized, and we have invested to a point that we have a team that you know, a team of ex consultants who you know creates the you know collateral frameworks. Um, you know, does value assessment type consulting work with the clients, uh, and also creates bots. We have you know, uh, we we drink our own champagne, so we have bots where you know you can come in and you know chat with that bot and it will provide you guidance like a CSM on hey, where to focus. It's going to ask you a few questions. Wow. So the, the level of investment will suggest easily that it's it's a top-down push, right? And then the the folks in in uh, customer leadership, you know, my my peer leaders, 
and and my sales leadership we all have come from enterprise background where we know that you know this the whole relationship and the retention of your revenue and expansion is going to be driven by uh, you know the your ability to capture the value expected and you know measure the value realized and be able to play that back to the economic buyer and perhaps new user groups uh, in the form of a value story so it's wow. it's uh, you know both ends have met where the team is capable of doing that team knows um, you know how to do it and there is a mandate uh, an investment top down fantastic so i got to ask and from my perspective, I've talked to a lot of leaders. I feel that you're unique, right? I feel like you you're really on on an outlier of doing this. In your world, having worked at MuleSoft, having worked at these large enterprises, leading organizations, how common is this really? What this what you're enabled at Workado is that? Do you feel like a lot of your peers are implementing and, and talking about this, or is this? Do you feel like Workado is really best in class at doing this? Yeah, I I mean, of course, Workado is, you know, best in class, but, you know, I, I want to give credit to where this all, for me at least, originated. It was at MuleSoft. You know, we we started uh, value engagement over there. And and so, uh, you know, call it my bias, you know, I'm I'm connected. I'm always hearing about these things from my my peers and peers of my peers where this is really done very well. So sure. we, we had a fantastic value motion at, you know, um, Workado, uh, there is a similar team at Data IQ. A lot of credit to uh, you know uh, folks over there, Claire Gubain, who has built out that function in Data IQ. Sure. Uh, and and you know companies like Celanis, where some of my peers went as customer value managers. Right. Even the role says value managers. <laughs> yeah. CSM. So I think you know. Why it seems uncommon is because, you know, as I was sharing with you in, in, in the preface, uh, folks from, you know, our line of work are actually not coming out there to share these stories with the world. And I wish more people will do that. We'll talk about that towards the end. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's beginning to be very common. There's a customer value community that has uh, been spun up by ecosystems, uh, which is, you know, providing a lot of, um, you know, uh, thought leadership, insights, and and a place for people to come together, learn from each other. So I'm hoping that this becomes more, you know, known and and more common uh, for other people to adopt. That's exactly why I started this podcast too, right? It's all about sharing stories, future customer value. We have to be talking about this to normalize it and to make sure that we can implement it at various companies yeah. for their customers because the customers are the ones who seek to benefit or get hurt the most if there's a lack of value engagement. So it's it's really cool to hear you talk about this. I'm, I'm very excited. It's probably one of the best conversations I've had around enterprise value. So let's keep it going here. I want to yeah. take take us back to your world. Let's go down memory lane here to MuleSoft. You mentioned that just uh -huh. as, as one of the pioneering organizations doing this, you learned a lot from there. So talk to us about the art here, the art of building the strategic account engagement organization. And how did MuleSoft uniquely think about this? And you mentioned a framework in our conversation. I'd love for you to talk about that framework as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but give us paint the picture for us there at MuleSoft. Yeah, I think uh, so. You know, it's it's gonna sound surprising to many uh, in MuleSoft in customer success and many other function. Our our biggest concern, our job number one, was hiring. Always hire someone who's better than rest of us. That is how we raise the bar. That is how we got all A plus players. Now with A plus players, uh, you know, you 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 give them the right, uh, you know, environment and leadership support. So we had a fantastic, you know, cross collaboration and ownership culture. I mean, we are never told to go build something. We would, uh, we, we developed this habit of, you know, uh, prioritizing what we need, you know, and testing out our solution, measuring, iterating, and then scaling. And you would almost expect like, oh, it's been on the clock. It, it's been six months. We should expect the next version of customer success. Like, it's almost like we we need this. We need like, uh, you know, um, let's say if you're a fan of Star Wars, uh, Star Wars, right? You, you need something to come out every year. <laughs> and so that's, that's how our customer success was that we, uh, you know, refresh. Um, and then 
data orientation right uh, was extremely important we we had you know ton of spreadsheets in those days right um, where it allowed us to focus on you know hey what are the biggest opportunities and what are the biggest risks right kind of outliers and uh, assign resources focus on on those engagements where we can make a difference so sure. that whole resource allocation piece building out that book of business there was no standard of like how many accounts should someone have how you know what's the arr they should have you know how do we do x y and z and so we were building those out um, as we were pivoting from the cs 1.0 which was more retention focused uh, mulesoft customer success was part of the revenue organization and we carried actually revenue quota so we were revenue focused right renewals and expansions and experience. Um, and so as we were building those out, uh, you know, the framework that I talked about, I mean, it's not a CS framework, it's a general problem solving and decision uh, framework many should be familiar with. There's a Canadian framework, I think it's a Welsh word. Uh, word. Uh, and this framework really uh, provides you a way of thinking about problems, the, the nature of, of problems are challenging, simple, complicated, complex, chaotic, disorder, and then has, you know, a suggestion on how to deal with those, right? So I'll just talk about simple, you know, problems where the cause and effect relationship is known. You do something, you should expect something, you can correlate it back. Right. You know, we, we call it standardization, right? The problems of the category of onboarding are in that bucket. So, you know, uh, thinking about problems in a certain way. Now, you cannot standardize, for example, many parts of customer expansion. You have to have certain tools. So customer expansion, you would put that in, you know, complex situation where, you know, you will have playbooks, but it's all about, um, you know, probing what's the opportunity, figuring out what to do, and then responding. You don't have like, okay, if the customer does this, I will do Y, right? There's no straight correlation. And then you have uh, what is called complicated problems where cause and effect may be known, but you don't know it clearly. This is where you need expert treatment. So what are the situations in which we will have to pull in an expert without just you know having a customer suffer through 30 days of pain and <laughs> then getting an expert? So for right. example, an architecture design or architecture, you know, solutioning kind of situation, establishing a COE. If a customer asks you, hey, how do I scale this? And you have a CSM who has not been part of a, you know, change management, transformative type of function, then putting them there means you lose credibility. Sure. So figuring out what kind of problem you're dealing with and what solutions to apply or try uh, was very critical. So that's how we did some of our, you know, decision making and problem solving. And you have, you know, chaotic situation. We we had uh, one of the uh, magazines publish this article, um, you know, on how we handled, MuleSoft handled a critical security flaw that had become known, right? We contacted individually by the phone within 48 hours, every oh, wow. one of our 700 customers before we were ready to publish this defect uh, in, in the world, right? Uh, every customer appreciated, you know, like they gave us examples of how many security flaws they've had where they didn't hear back and everyone sort of directed them to a web page. You know, we had this situation where we didn't know, we hadn't faced it, we didn't know what to do. Chaotic situation where you just, you know, break down the problem, probe different parts, and just act, right? You don't have a playbook. You don't want right, to right. this too much. So uh, this, this sort of a framework really helped us put right solutions to the problems, challenges, opportunities we were facing. And I think the beauty there is you first have to identify and categorize. What are you dealing with? Is it yeah. a simple problem? Is it a complex mm -hmm. one, a chaotic yeah. one? Because that's how you can change your perspective, not even the playbook or solution. They may not, they may, may not be a playbook, as you're saying. Yeah, right? they, they, they may not be. be. Yeah, so that, that's yeah. so true. I mean, you know, mismatching the approach to the domain 
of the problem can lead to you know ineffective or even disastrous impact right? <laughs> yeah yeah and i think also the what, what i love about what you said there is like the empathy towards the customer because everything that you're talking about here is very customer centric it's yeah. not vendor selfish we need to do this for ourselves it's how can we best serve the customer oh the customer needs to ask about scaling we need a center of excellence to help them drive the resourcing internally to drive this forward okay how is your customer going to view us because of the security flaw? Let's call them, right? They've never experienced that before. So I, I, I think what's central to this, and it, we haven't labeled it as such, but is it has to be a customer first, customer empathy lens through any action you take, because that's what's going to drive results and engagement ultimately is the yeah. intent behind it. Absolutely. I, I, I want to shout out to... Simon Parmet, he was our CRO and then CEO, head of sales, and used to, uh, you know, often remind us that we should deliver experience in excess of expectations of the customer, always in every interaction. Right. <laughs> that that was like kind of a guiding principle uh, around customer centricity, where we would think, hey, what does the customer expect here, and how do I exceed that? And and that's where expectation or reality surpassing expectation that's fulfillment that's happiness right that's that's the wow factor so i think that's uh it's it's really important to to embed that into the organization well let's move to a specific example within mulesoft yeah. now mm -hmm. of a large customer where they were on premises right it was difficult yeah. to measure the value we've, we've talked a lot about what is the value um, expectations, right? In sales How, and then the value realization on the post-sales side. And typically yeah. we have a lot of data at our fingertips to be able to do that. But when you're on premises for a SaaS platform or technology platform, it's hard to do that. So talk to us about this particular account, not having access to the system that you needed to measure value, yet you were able to drive some incredible results. So what happened there? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll talk about this uh, large, uh, American insurance, uh, you know, company. Uh, so on-prem, right, financial services, they typically don't like any, um, you know, agents running in their uh, premises that will transmit any usage information, anything, right? They call it Trojan horse. Um, and they will shut it down no matter how how much you prove uh, what kind of information is leaving their premises. So we, we knew about it and we, we knew, you know, in spite of this being in our contract as something that they would open up, it's one of the preconditions for us being able to support them properly. When rubber hits the road, you know, the operation teams, you know, do not allow that. So knowing this, we we kind of went and prepared, you know, to actually educate the customer on the importance of collecting these metrics for them on our behalf. So that's a critical piece, right? If I'm asking customer to tell me what their usage is looking like, and they're pretty cagey because they know an upsell conversation is coming if you're you know, overusing. <laughs> right? more, they'll get it. Um, they, they'll they'll get it. And the the idea here was that we educate the customer to show them, hey, if for for your competence to be visible, and to show how sophisticated, you know, practice you run. To show that your leadership, you need to have a handle on your KPIs and metrics that matter. So don't do it for me. Don't tell me what your usage is. Do it for yourself. Do it for your career. Do it to, uh, you know, position yourself as someone who's creating value that can be measured. Right? You don't go to your leadership and say, "I've completed six projects." Well, they could have been done with any technology. Why did you buy MuleSoft? Right? So you right. have to be able to say, "Hey." If I did this in this particular legacy way, I was gonna spend eight million dollars, and with MuleSoft, I was able to get it done in three point five million dollars in six months instead of eighteen months. Right. So, to educate them, set them up, to give them the tools. That education starts right before or during onboarding. So our onboarding was pretty, you know, comprehensive. We planned for it. We gave them tools structure, framework, and this coaching. And then it kind of became very natural. I didn't have to go pester them to get these stats out of the platform. 
they had dashboards where they would pull up and show me. The premise being that as their customer success manager, I was their advisor, right? If I do not know what's going on, right? I won't be able to, you know, guide you to do anything better. I won't be able to tell you, uh, you know, where do you stand with respect to the benchmarks? What other customers are doing? How much uh, velocity they have? What what kind of value are they creating, right? So uh, you sort of create a little bit of that FOMO, if I may, um, but leave it in their hands as their responsibility that they need to execute on their own. And for me to then track that into a joint success plan and to present in the QBR, have them present in the QBR, their value matrix. Like you make them own the problem was, was our strategy, not the problem, but the, you know, the whole infrastructure of, of measuring. So what that allowed us to do that when time came for renewal and, you know, when procurement started to look at, you know, pricing alone, price for X units and price for the new Y units at renewal, uh, you know that team was able to tell their procurement uh, the re the the value multiple they were getting from our investment, wow. and our awesome. our position was just that that hey you know if you invest X and you are getting seventeen X value, imagine if your spend was three X you'll get fifty X value right, um, and so we were able to do that and along the way we captured some qualitative metrics right this company had. Uh, you know, in their uh, annual reporting to analysts, investors, Wall Street, they they published, you know, ten strategic projects aimed at saving like something like eight billion, and we were associated with five of those. Wow! Right, and and it was important for us to not only show that linkage, but all also show the actual dollar impact on those. Wow! Right, and that all came from the being able to open up the usage internally yes exactly so we, we had the capability uh, and they had to because they weren't gonna let that data get shipped to our systems where you can see the dashboards and everything uh, they had to build their own so that they had to make an investment uh, to yes. compensate for this lack of connectivity and then figure out themselves so what what we gave them was a uh, you know a packaged offline solution that they can plug in those metrics, but it's going to run on their premises and Brilliant. they can build any, any of their dashboards. So um, it was, was uh, quite a success. We were able to, uh, it was already a multi-million land, but we were able to grow that account 3X, you know, coming close to about $10 million over a period of just 24 months. That is incredible. And what I love about that story in particular is how you were able to get the customer to co-invest because that's such a rare thing. It's not just change management of here's how your processes need to change, but actually <laughs> leveraging their technology resources, their engineering resources to help create the right attribution for value here. And yeah. that's that's a rarity too. So I think it, it goes to show that we often think about sales and post sales, right? As these two discrete things, but it's not that it's a continuation of value. It's a continuation of sales. If you want to call it that, but really it's helping the customer understand how to improve all, every step of the way and ultimately get to that promised land of being associated with five initiatives on that, on that list. Right. I think that's a dream for many companies to, to be yeah. at that level. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think the the important thing here, Sagar, is that um, having them own it for their own reasons, right? Uh, most of the times we see SMs. I mean, we want to measure value so that we can have you know revenue retention or we can expand, right? So when I met the CDO for this organization, you know, I I told him in my I think first or second meeting, he asked me, hey, how, you know, what do other customers do? you know, other customer, other stakeholders like me, how do they engage after the post sales? Like, what do you guys do? And I told them, hey, with other CIOs and CTOs, I typically, you know, review these kinds of value dashboards and so on that come from our product. And in your case, unfortunately, I won't be able to do that because you shut this thing off. And so this gentleman goes, hey, but we do want this, right? See, I'm, I'm yet to meet an executive 
who doesn't want KPIs and metrics, right? Who doesn't want ROI numbers. Right. So, um, you know, creating that little bit of FOMO drives that ownership of this opportunity and that feeds into then, yeah, of course, we want to be sophisticated. We want to know where our dollars are going and what value we are creating. That drives that investment uh, that we saw in this uh, particular customer. So kudos to them for like recognizing, you know, what's the right thing to do there for their own careers in the organization. Right. And I think the the point about making this about them, <clears throat> how this is going to help them advance their careers, get make them the hero internally. Exactly. That's what drives the adoption of the change management. There's adoption of technology, which is different than the adoption of the change management. I think here it's so important that no matter what stage you're at, emotionally connecting it to your end user, your champion, your executive buyer's career aims and ambitions and personal needs is that's part of the that's part of the strategy here, yeah. part of the engagement. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you mentioned the word customer hero, right? So interestingly, in Workado, we just uh, spun up a program called Customer Hero, where we are packaging, uh, you know, some assets and some tools for you know our power users, our champions, that they can run um, and collect data and and you know present using some of those tools. We're gonna provide them with those skills on, on how to go and talk about their successes inside the organization, like really turn a power user into a hero. And that means, you know, coaching them on presentation skills to talk about capabilities, even, you know, talk about our roadmap internally in their own language. We right. have, uh, you know, a, a program to support those customers. So this is so critical for us to really make it about them and their organization and the impact of our platform on their organization. And that level of advocacy will have a multiplier effect on all of your efforts because half the battle is getting inside the door, right? And getting the champion yeah. to be convinced. But if they're already convinced now they can convince the next 10 people, you have a force multiplier of 10X on, on your efforts and in your team's efforts. So yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, we can't leave that to chance. And I love how you put that into a strategy for every single customer rather than in the individual heroics on the CSM side. How many times yeah. are there great 10X performers who are individual CSMs and they're doing great, but it's not an organizational cultural phenomenon, right? So uh, that's the difference here. I love that. Awesome. Well, I'm going to keep uh, us moving to the next section, Mahesh, which is a fan favorite. Mm. Uh, the show and it's a tough one it's called the rapid fire question section Love i'm going to ask you eight questions and there's rule here where you can only respond and i'm going to give you a limit of three words all right okay so three words max first thought that comes to mind eight questions here we go what's the best metric of success for customer success number of measurable customer outcomes in engagement awesome Couple extra words there, but I'll, that was a good answer. So I'll give it to you. <laughs> uh, worst metric of success for CS? Activities performed, documents created. Oh, yes. Activity does not equal value. Most underrated part of CS? Bringing feedback to product. Oh, huge. Most overrated part of CS? I'm going to get killed here. Product <laughs> adoption. It's necessary. Not sufficient. Ooh, amazing. I'll have to cut that line out and put that as the <laughs> poster for this episode. All right, last few. Current state of CS. Identity crisis. <laughs> Future of CS. AI, you know, um, the next, your next CSM will be uh, bionic, human plus a bot. Oh, all right. Seems you already got some bot experience in the past here. We're at Arrocado. What is the best CS book or podcast? Ooh, many. I, I love uh, Seven Pillars of Customer Success and uh, Onboarding Matters. You know, really practical uh, books. I know there's more than three words, but really impactful. Thank you uh, to those authors. Uh, Awesome. for doing this uh gain grow retain podcast and and re more recently the digital customer success by alex uh, turkovich i am I'm, I'm loving that awesome awesome yeah 
uh, those are all great. Donna Weber, who wrote Onboarding Matters, is a yeah. friend of Foresight as well. So she's great. Shout out to Donna. Um, awesome. And what is the best community for leaders like yourself? Um, CS Leadership Network Slack and uh, Game Girl Retain Community, Jay and Jeff have done fantastic job. CSLN, Miranda Tikonsky, she's, she's herself an amazing leader. I've learned a lot from her posts. And so, you know, you reflect uh, that's that's reflected in the community as well, the caliber of people and the quality of, uh, you know, discussions we have in that Slack. Incredible. All, all great folks there. Okay, so last two questions, and we're going to think about the future state of our industry here, Mahesh. Mm -hmm. So we can make one prediction, right? You talked yeah. about AI being uh, one of the thoughts around the future, but where's our industry going? And I'm going to keep it industry, not just CS, because you've held a yeah. lot of roles, but there's a lot of identity crisis, as you mentioned. What What do you think is going to be the upshot of all this identity crisis and change? Yeah, I think, uh, so, you know, if you look at the origins of the, you know, role, there's, there's a lot of stuff CS does, or it, it originated in those, to fill those gaps in product experience, you know, service experience, support experience, and all of that. So as organizations are becoming you know, smarter and in, you know, trying to become better, the product experience will improve. So a lot of what we do as customer success, a lot of what companies do for customer success is, is going to get baked into these different roles. Customer success is going to become everyone's business. We got, you know, a couple of great examples here in, in Snowflake and, and how Salesforce is doing. So, what that will do is, you know, for the profession at least, CS profession, um, it allows us the ability to turn into strategist advisors to offer a, you know, a, a layer of service that companies can then monetize as premium offering, right? So seventy percent of what we do gets baked into the rest of the organization as a philosophy, as a feature, as a process. Yeah. And then other 30%, I feel like it will be monetized. Salesforce just started to do that, uh, uh, you know, a few months ago, a few years ago in premium offering um, on the lines of like consulting services. Wow. Yes. Yeah, that, that's, um, you know, a lot of organizations have the ecosystem. The Salesforce has built this. Yeah. Where you have these third parties will come and do a lot of the consulting and services, but for organizations to build that native capability, I think is a possibility once you reach the right stage. So it's mm -hmm. awesome. Cool. And final question here, Mahesh, is anything you'd like to plug with our audience? Well, How yeah, I mean, you know, um, we always like to connect with like-minded people. So you know, uh, connect me, connect with me over LinkedIn. Um, I, or, or I'm in, you know, eight or 10 customer success communities. So, you know, reach out, connect. Uh, I'm working on a stealth, you know, sort of personal project to actually create a platform to talk exclusively about this world of, you know, ultra high touch, ultra strategic customer success that I've had the opportunity, uh, you know, to be part of for the last uh, decade or so. And, and the idea is there's a lot of content about CS, valuable content, but it kind of, you know, doesn't address all of that. And we have to pick little bits and pieces. So um, I'm going to be building a, a platform, whether it will be a podcast or a book, you know, uh, still under the wraps uh, to, to suss out these practical strategies, practices from CSMs and uh, CS leaders in this uh, space who manage large accounts, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Fortune 500, you know, type of companies, large ARR. So uh, stay tuned uh, as my friends and I bring uh, this thing to life. And if anyone has any cool ideas, as I said, please connect with me on LinkedIn or through any of these communities if you want to join this effort. That sounds great. I'm, I'm eager to see what you launch here in the coming months and years. Uh, I think there's a big need for all things super high touch, upmarket, customer success. And I think you've got a unique lens on it. So sure. Our listener will be very excited about this as well. Well, this is fantastic. Thank you so much, Mahesh, for coming on the show and sharing your your deep insights across your career of numerous exciting opportunities. And 
I learned a lot personally. I think this is very illuminating for me and I'm sure our listener will appreciate as well. So thank you again for coming on the show. Sure thing. I appreciate you inviting me. I know this took a few months to get scheduled, uh, but I'm glad we are able to catch up. And uh, you know, thank you to all your listeners as well uh, and to you for you know, pulling this podcast together. Awesome. Well, we will be doing it again, uh, I'm sure, in the future and seeing how your predictions either ring true or are challenged by the reality of our world. So mm-hmm. let's make sure we get another session on the books. Thank you so much, Mahesh. That's and, it. Thank uh, you. We'll, we'll talk soon. Thanks. Once again, thank you for listening. This episode is brought to you by Foresight. If you're interested in learning more, please email them at info at gainforesight.co. That is info at G-A-I-N-F-O-R-E-S-I-G-H-T dot C-O. Thank you.